lot of people try to go to the gym. When I go to the gym, I don't go to the gym to work on my body. I go to the gym to work my mind and will. Then my body gets the results of my mind and will in action. Right. I, that's why I say I look and act like my mind and will. Okay. Right? And if I look and act like my mind and will, then whatever people see on the outside is the mind and will of the person that lives in the inside. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Today, we have partnered with Fit Expo in Los Angeles to bring you Podcast Nation. The Fit Expo is one of the most exciting live events within the US that gives attendees the opportunity to connect with various leaders in the fitness industry. Today, we sat down with a prominent American actor and fitness personality. In the late 80s, he starred in several movies and soon ended up creating Tybo, one of the most successful fitness programs of all time. We also had the opportunity to talk to the White House chef who made his way from a farm in the rural south to the Pentagon and to one of the most prestigious culinary positions in the US. Both share the insights on how to leverage the power of your mind and to get it to work for you to achieve your health and fitness goals. The training routine and diet the White House chef followed in order to get in shape and to build his 24 inch arms and what it really takes to really be able to achieve anything you set your mind to. So please enjoy this week's episode of the Escape the Limits podcast with Mr. Billy Blanks and Chef Rush. Mr. Billy Blanks, how are you doing? I'm very good, yeah, good. very good. Last time we spoke, we were kind of middle of the pandemic doing it from a from a camera so it's nice to do it face to face thank you I was um, I was watching your Instagram just before just us playing around before we started and I and I, I, I know you kind of have this fitness program and it's very fun mm -hmm. but I actually saw you there was this big nail sticking on a piece of wood and I and you just punched it straight through was yeah. that real yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was real you know uh, I practice martial arts been doing it for almost 50 years now I'm ninth degree black belt in Taekwondo ah. so along with you know, learning how to, you know, just kick and punch. My instructor taught us how to focus all our energies in certain areas. When I first did it, I drew, I put it through my hand, right? <laughs> but then it got used to, you know, just focusing and learning how to channel all the energy to where I need to, to channel it, to drive it through the board. It went in so easy, I should have done two because people thought it was fake, but it wasn't fake. It was real, real nail, real board. I gave everybody a chance to look at it so they could see what it was like. And uh, I just, you know, getting to put your mind in that state, in that focus, and then you go ahead and you do it. You know? Wow. There's no trick to it. A lot of people think there's tricks to, like, breaking <laughs> boards. And I think, you know, as a martial artist, when you see a martial art person break a board, it's just a focus. You know, it's to teach a young kid or an adult how to focus energy in the area where they need to focus it so mm -hmm. they can break the board or do what they need to do to help themselves be better. So that's an interesting concept because I've... I've got a business and I've got, got children and, a, and, and I'm married and that focus is quite interesting because it, let, let's take business for example, one of the challenges that people have in business and is, is that kind of distraction, you know, lots of things going on and, and you normally find that people that do really well have, have had the ability to consistently focus on one thing over a period of time and just even if they're kind of average at it, they seem to be way better than everybody else because they've been able to focus. Mm -hmm. Do you find that that skill in martial arts carries over in different areas of life, being able to sort of, you know, focus your mind on specific tasks and, and, and pursue it until you get there? Well, I think a martial arts focus is great. I think, you know, it's something that helped me out, you know. I think one of the most important things to me is realize what is, the, what is, like for me, I say, what is fitness greatest two enemies? What is, what is life greatest two enemies? What do you think they are? What do you think they are? Distraction, I would say, maybe, is okay. one. Um, and what's the other two? We, we chatted about it funny, so I think I've probably got the answer, but lack of purpose? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, for me, this is what I do, you know, because I ask people, if I ask you a question, I say, hey, grab this for one second. Do you believe you have that in your hand? At the moment, until so you probably snatch it away from me. <laughs> no, do you believe you have that in your hand? I do, yeah. You do what? I believe I have this in my hand. Give it to me and ask me that same question. Do you believe you have that in your hand? No. I know it's in my hand. Ah, okay. What does belief got to do with this? Nothing. Okay. Right? So always, though, people, when people, when you go at something, people go at something and believing. So I should ask you a question. Do you believe you can be a football player? Do you believe you can do that? What kind of word is that? To me, it's a responding word. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean, doesn't mean you're going to act on it. Interesting. Right? So I always tell people, especially if I'm training them, I ask them, do you believe you can get in shape? They go, 
Yeah, I believe it. But they didn't give me the word that I wanted to hear because believing is one thing, knowing is another. Okay. And when you know something, then you act acting on it. When you believe in something, then you're sitting on the couch and what you want to go for is never going to come to pass because, one, most people, when they go try to go for something, they try to do it. And I always say the word try, take it out of my vocabulary. I don't even like to use that word. I can say I'm going to do it. It's like me trying to tell you to walk through that door. Try to walk through that door. You know how to walk through that door. You might not be able to walk through it the way you want to walk through it, but if you keep walking through it, sooner or later you're going to be able to walk through it the way you want to. So I just think putting powerful things in your mind, in, in your will. Like I know I read the Bible a lot. You know, I'm, I'm a faith man, so I always say death and life is in the power of the tongue. That didn't come from me. It come from God. But death and life is in the power of your tongue. Then the last part of that scripture is though those who love it will get the fruit of it, right? So I was like, why did God use the word fruit? And I believe God used the word fruit because fruit accomplishes seeds. If you take a seed and you plant it in the ground, you nourish it, what happens to it? It comes to life. So if I use my abilities to help me plant a seed, if, if, if I'm doing the right thing, it's going to be fruitful. It's going to come to pass. Things are going to come out good. But what happens to people, they go, well... You know, that's going to be too hard. No, it's not. I always say, take the word hard out of your mind and say it's going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. I'd rather for something to be a challenge and say, it's too hard. I'll never be able to do that. Take that away and say, yeah, it's going to be a challenge. And what's good about a challenge? You can find out so many different experiences. You know, to be able to experience something and then walk away with, wow, man, if I did this, that means I could do this. If I did this, that means I could do this. So then a challenge is, a challenge take you further and further and further, and you never quit, you never give up. But when you say hard, then... So I'm going to go slightly somewhere different than I plan on going with this conversation, but you mentioned belief and you mentioned, I know you're a man of faith, Mm -hmm. and a lot of times we say, you know, people, it's good to have a belief in something greater than yourself, Mm -hmm. a belief. Mm -hmm. That word tends to be used a lot. In in the example that we just had here, you were like, okay, I don't believe, I know. What's, what do you, how do you describe your relationship then with, um, your, with, My with God, your faith? Is, 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 it, is it a belief? It sounds like it probably isn't, but how? No. how? Now, like, it's like for me, I don't tell people what to believe in because I say, you know, whatever you believe in, you take it and make sure it can take you where you want it to, to you go in your life, right? I believe Jesus is Lord of my life. And if I do the things that he tell me to do, then I'm gonna go do. I'm gonna get what he says. I'm gonna get. Why? Because I believe God is a never. God is a not a changing God. He's always the same. He'll be there forever and ever and ever. Where if I lean on man, right? Man changes 24/7. Or you know, like a friend can say, "Hey, come to my house, man. I caught a fish this big. When you get there, it's only this big, <laughs> right?" But you're looking for what they say. And so, if words are powerful, then I got to make sure when I'm teaching or if I'm going for something that it's realistic and it's got to be something that I can reach out and grab and train and work hard and see a vision. And I can, when that vision is there, I'm, I can go toward it instead of, ooh, that's too hard, that's too far away, I don't know if I'll be able to do that. You know, so faith for me is important. Mm. You know, I look at God's word and I say, okay, how can I take God's word and put it into what I do? Like I always say this to people, I say I look and act like my mind and will. I always ask people, my clients to say that. Say that again. I look and act like my mind and will. Then I say, say it like this. I look and act like my body. That's how most people are. You ever hear, you ever hear this? Somebody say, that's a sense-minded person. You ever hear that? No, I haven't. No. Do you know what that means? <laughs> no, go on, explain. Just okay, so you say, that's a sense-minded person. Most people think by their five senses. Okay. What I see, what I touch, what I feel, what I hear. If you base your life on your five senses, then you're going to always be a person that's going to be up and down and all around. Because emotionally, you know, people get into emotional things. So if I build my life on my emotions, then I'm going to always be here, here, over here, over here, and never get to where I need to go. So I don't build my life on that. I build my life on, on spiritual things because they stay and they solid and they stay there. And, and it's not a necessity. It's not a need. Do you know what I mean? Introducing the next big thing in functional training, the Escape Barrow, a revolutionary training tool that combines a loaded farmer's carry with a sled push to develop hip, grip, and core strength. 
Developed in partnership with Pete Holman, inventor of the TRX Rip Trainer and Nautilus Glute Drive, the Escape Barrow can be rolled, pushed, dragged and carried. The Escape Barrow packs a punch with an impressive load capacity of 440 pounds and with a two-stage galvanized paint covering process, it's also ideal for outdoor use. So head over to escapefitness.com forward slash barrow. That's escapefitness.com forward slash barrow to find out more. Enjoy the rest of this episode. So when you say spiritual then, like how, because it sounds like anything that you, you describe is, is an action in some way. It's not like a belief. I kind of, it, it seems as though it's like a, you're, you're taking something that's not physical and you're creating like a, a physical thing to it. So what, but, but, but what it is too is this, like, like you ever get a vision? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. And where do you think it came from? I, I, I question myself about See, that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what I say. You know, I get visions, and I know it didn't, a dream. You know, you get dreams, you know, visions and dreams. And I believe a vision and dream comes from up, up above. Mm -hmm. God shoots something down at you, and you, the person that's supposed to pick it up. And when you pick it up, you go, wow, where'd that come from? I, mm. When I'm running, make, normally those things right, happen. Right, <laughs> right. And with me, it's like I'm, you know, I could be sitting here, I could be in, in the class, teaching a class, and all of a sudden God will give me a vision. He'll give me a purpose to go, I need, you, you need to go over and speak to that person. Because you look in the hearts of people, right? By looking in the heart of a person is looking in their eyes and you talk to them. And you can see their heart, right? And then from there, then you start to say the things that I believe that the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me gives me an opportunity to talk to people. I don't second guess it. I just go, okay, this is what you want me to do. I'm going to step out and I'm going to do it. it might, the person might say, hey, that's, I always go, that's something that you need. Well, God told me to tell you that. How do you know what to listen to? Like, do you get, do you get, do you get a very clear voice into you that's very specific and you, 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 you don't need, need to sort of question, is this what I should be hearing? Or do you sometimes get a number of things and you kind of got to like think, is this, is this, one thing or is it another thing? No, you know, God, God will come to you and it will come to me and tell me, Billy, I, you need to go say this. And, I'll and you'll know who it is talking to you. Right? Yeah. Okay. And I'll go and that's, you know, it's, I, it's a step. I'm stepping out because some people can say, no, that ain't for me. You know, why, do you, why, do you, why do you say that to me? But most of the time when I go and say something to a person, it's, it's the truth. You know? How long have you sort of known that that, that is? Ever since I was a kid. Right. You know, I always sat and when I was a kid coming up, I always would sit and talk to seniors. Just sit down with them, go to dinner with them. I would take a senior to dinner, dinner, you know, because I wanted to hear what they had to say about life. I would ask questions. I wouldn't talk enough about nothing that I do. I would talk about life. I want to know how do I make myself become a better person? How do how did this because they live a life, and so for me to be the best I can be, I'm gonna go ask people who live longer than me, right? And so then. I can go experience, experience the physical and the mental and the spiritual things that they say will happen to you. And then as you go read it, so I'll open up the Bible. I like to read the Bible a lot. And I, I don't, you know, I just don't agree with everything. I question God. I always ask God questions. God said, treat me like I'm your father. So I'm going to ask him a question. Hey, what about this? And God will give me an answer. Sooner or later, somebody will come and they'll tell me what God wanted me to hear. I believe that. It could be, I believe angels are around people all the time. Like Eric the trainer, mm -hmm. I believe that he was, a, he was an angel to yeah. people. And sometimes people didn't get it. I just felt like him himself, I just wish that in his hard time that he could have showed his vulnerability mm. so he could be helped himself. And I think when you get into like his status and people who do do fitness and they way up here, sometimes they don't want to show that vulnerability. And because they don't want to show that, then things that go on the side of them, people can't help you with because mm. you don't really put it out there. Me, I'm going to show you my vulnerability because I'm, I'm a man just like you're a man. And I always ask this question, what's the difference between me and you? What would you say? What's the difference between me and you? Yeah. It's a tough question to ask. I don't, well, probably not too much, really, in some ways. We're mm. very similar. We're... You know, we live and breathe. We have challenges. We've, we, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of you know, outside of our lives. On one level, are quite different, but on another level, we're, we're, we're pretty much identical. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what vulnerable. I say to people, what I say to people, I go like this: the only difference between me and you 
Now, not just you. I could be talking to people on the camera, right? Because the only difference between me and you is how we use our will. Okay. I have a mind. I have a will. That's what's going to what's determine. Your will? What, what's your, how do you describe your will? My will. Okay, I have a mind, right? In my mind, it's, it's, it's if I take this and I take, for instance, this is a, this is a, I'll say this, this is a shoe. It's a bottle of water right now, but I'm going to say this is a shoe, right? Because I don't want to take my sneaker off and put it up <laughs> over here. But I want people to understand this is a shoe. So if I tell the shoe, move to the left, I can make that a move. Why won't it move? Well, typically, those types of things don't move on their own. <laughs> okay. So take, for instance, I put the shoe on, right? And I got it on my foot. But, so, guys, I'm using this as my, as my foot right now, right? <laughs> So if I'm saying, shoo, move to the left, why won't it move? Well, well, it will move if you're telling your foot to move with it on. So I want to move, though. I'm saying, move, shoo, move to the left. Why come it won't move? Shoes don't move on their own. <laughs> but I got it on my foot now. OK. So why won't it move? Well, you need to tell your foot to move, not the Because I don't will it. You want, OK. I don't will it. That's the difference between mind and will. My mind can pick up something, but if I don't will it to happen, it ain't going to never happen. Okay. And I always tell people, when you're going for something, you can always mindfully think about doing something, but if you don't will it to do it, it's never going to happen. How do you make your body change? I have to will mind it to change. It won't change by itself. A lot of people try to go to the gym. When I go to the gym, I don't go to the gym to work on my body. I go to the gym to work my mind and will. Then my body gets the results of my mind and will in action. Right. I, that's why I say I look and act like my mind and will. Okay. Right? And if I look and act like my mind and will, then whatever people see on the outside is the mind and will of the person that lives in the inside. So, so in putting that down into bringing that down into fitness again, mm -hmm. how do you train your mind and will? Because most people, I've, for five years now, I've been doing this, and, and many successful trainers say the same thing. It all starts up here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's great. Um, we get that. But what... Just like if you wanted to train your biceps, you do bicep curls. Mm -hmm. How do you train your mind? Well, what, what, are one or, what are one or two steps that people can start working on to train their mind and will then? Okay, so I would say, like, say if I want to train my biceps, my chest and shoulders, I go to the gym. Most people go to the gym to see a chest and shoulder change. Okay, now I'm training my, I'm, oh, my chest is getting bigger. Just, but what, 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 what does that have to do with your will? Well, to me, I think if you, when you go to the gym, I say the first 20 minutes of a workout is what? First, you ask 20, the person, minutes first 20 minutes of a workout is what? Warming up? Yeah, people say that. It's a warm up, it's, it's a start, whatever. Okay. But I say the first 20 minutes of a workout is all physical. Why? Yeah. Because I'm physically fresh. So I don't need my mind and will. No. I go in the gym and I'm physically fresh. I can do a lot of stuff. Then what happens after the 20 minutes? Something starts to knock on the door to your will, right? And what's behind the door of your will? People open up that door, something is saying, quit. That's too hard for you. You're never going to do that. You never do. So that's how the mind and will works, right? So I always say, I have to know when I first walk into the gym, I don't want to be physical. I want to be mentally, spiritually there. So I can know what's happening to my body from the first minute to the last minute. People don't do that. They go in there, they get pumped up, they get tired, and then they go, man, it's getting a little hard. Let me uh, they back off. They quit. And they don't know how to push forward. They don't know how to go past that point. And I believe if you go in there with a mind and you go in there with a will, something's always going to knock on the door. What is it that knocks on the door to a person when they go into a training session? What well, do you think it is? What, well, what knocks on your door when you start to feel pain? Yeah, it's like someone telling you that's enough probably. But know? what do you think it is? There's five things that you have. Okay. The well, senses. Oh, okay. Your well, five senses. They knock on the door to a will of, the will of a person. That's too hard. Ooh, I'm getting hot. Ooh, this is, ooh, I'm feeling too much pain here. So when the sense of mind starts to knock on the door to your will, then you start to you open up that door. And what's behind that door is a person that really don't have confidence, really don't have this and really don't have, they don't have the certain things they need to help build them up and make them strong. Mm -hmm. So I always say will-minded. I want to work on my will. I want to work on my mind. I want to be able to control my body. I have the power to be able to do that. Why? God told me. God told me I have a lot of power. So who do you think I'm going to believe? You think I'm going to believe man or you think I'm going to believe God? Well, God said I can do anything. Billy, if you look in the Bible, God says this to me. Billy, go outside and look at that mountain. 
If you have no doubt in your mind, you can move that mountain. What in my life is going to be as big as that mountain? <laughs> Nothing. And he is true, because I can go outside and get a bulldozer. That might take me months and years to move it, but I can move it, right? Physically, I can move it. Mm -hmm. But God's saying spiritually, there's nothing in your life going to be that big that you can't move it if you believe and know that I gave you that power to be able to do that. So I always tell people, you have the power within you to do anything you want to do with your life, but you have to know how to go get it. And if you don't know how to, if you don't know how to, how to go get it, then you can't do it. And if you don't know the enemies that stop you, and I always say this to myself, I have five senses. They knock on my door 24-7. And if I don't work on putting my five senses in a choke chain and controlling them, they'll get me in trouble, they'll make me quit, they'll make me do all kinds of things that I don't want to be doing. And then you go back at the end, you go, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Too late, it's already happened. Now you gotta pay the consequences of what you've done. You, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's the everyday, that's the everyday work for me. And when I'm training my clients, it's the everyday work for them too, because every client that you train, they physically want to get into a workout, not understanding that the mental part is the most important. So what do you do in the first 20 minutes? And you said, like, don't let your first sense, your five senses take away that first part. Like, how would you typically I take... talk to people first. You talk to people. I always talk to people. What do you talk about? I, say, I always say this. Uh, say this out loud, everybody. I look and act like my mind and will. Let's do it again. I look and act like my mind and will. Good. Say it like this. I look and act like my body. They do it. That's, say, that's how most people are. They look and act like what they see in the mirror. They quit and get discouraged because they don't see things happen. Don't be like that. Don't be that person. Be the person that have a will and has a mind that can take you anywhere you want to go. You just, you just don't have to be willing to go through the fire. And if you're willing to go through the fire, then you're going to see results. And then as you go through the fire, look at it and realize it and go, wow, and I'm going to take that, I'm going to write this down. Because most people try to remember things and don't care who you are. Nobody can remember things. But when you start writing things down that's successful, that you go back and read it, it's going to give you the power to make them keep making changes and keep making changes. But people don't do that. So how often then, in terms of creating a habit, like if, some, if, you, had, if you had to say, okay, like here's a habit that you can create mm -hmm. today that when, you know, before you start, because with January, people are starting fitness journeys. What would you say are a couple of really simple things that, that someone could do to help train that will to be able to stick through these? Okay, this is one thing that I would do. This is, this is Billy Blank stuff, right? <laughs> so this is one thing I would tell people. I would say, hey, don't create a habit. Don't create a habit. Why? I don't know. Then if, if you create a habit, then you're not mindful anymore. Okay. People who create habits have a tendency to Unconscious. Not, not unconsciously do yeah. things. Okay. So then if I'm, if I'm unconsciously doing things, I really then, like that. then you don't build power right from okay. that. But if I'm constantly thinking about what I need to do, then I'm going to get better. Conscious. And what happens to people, especially in people in, uh, not just fitness, but in the world, right? You know, you, you ever hear the word seared, seared? Seared, like as in tuna. Or yeah, you know how you sear tuna or you sear steak? Yeah. That's a sear, person, what happens to people, they start to become seared, conscious wise. Their conscience gets seared, and when your conscience is seared, it's numb. Mm -hmm. Then you can't make any changes anymore. I don't want to be a person with a seared conscience. I want to be a person that's conscious, knowing 24-7, if it's wrong, it's wrong. If it's right, it's right. I know that for a fact. And what's going to make me be the best I can be is understanding that. Right? So if I'm going to do something, now take for instance, if I did something and I kept doing it by habit, and then all of a sudden, I go back and try to find my keys. And I'm like, <laughs> if I'm doing that, I can never, I'll never be able to achieve the goals that I needed to achieve. So I don't want to do things by habit. I want to do things by thought process. People in my class, they come to my class and they know Tybo, right? For 30 years, I have people who've been doing Tybo for 30 years. I turn off the music right away and say, look, you guys think that you know what I'm going to get ready to do, but you don't because you're so used to moving by habit. Take away the habit and bring in a thought process. Mm. And when you endure, when you're in a thought process, your body got to change, your mind got to change because you're thinking. Oh, I love that. That's a really, uh, that's a really. So, so to answer that question before we, before we get kind of kicked out, what what would be? So we're removing habit. Mm. So what would be one skill then? Let's use. Is that a word that? Okay. So yeah. So 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 so. Like to take Vincent, if I want to uh, teach you how to throw a kick. Okay. Right. And I'll say, okay, now I want you to practice this move. And just remember, be mindful about everything that you're doing. 
And sometimes people don't want to be mindful of fitness. They just want to do it, yeah. right? But then if you just want to do it, then you can't expect results. Because a person who's mindful is the one who's very successful. <laughs> a person who's unmindful is unsuccessful. It can't be. So be mindful about what you do. If I tell you to step and turn your hips like this, be mindful about why, why you're doing it, even when you have to do it fast. No matter what I'm doing, I'm being mindful about it because I know being mindful makes me change. Being unmindful and just doing things out of habit, anybody can do that. I, that's when I, go, when I go out there on that floor and I teach. I don't want people to be out there just moving because they see me move. I have to be able to explain things to people, and I want to see people mind working. You know, when you see a person's mind working, then they go, whoa, I didn't even realize I could do that. Then they start to realize more things. Then all of a sudden they go, you know what, thank you for telling me to do something. Now I understand what I got to do to help myself be better at anything else that I do. Right. And then your mantra, you're probably not going to call it a mantra, but mm -hmm. what, your, I, I, what, what is, the, what is the, the sort of um, phrase that you use? My, my phrase is on my back. See this? I look... I look and act just like, like my, my mind, mind and will. will. So is this part of that's that's for me for me that's my mantra. I always I always say I look and act like my mind and will. I look and act like my mind and will. How do you how do you stop that from being a habit where you just now what, habitually what, what, say what, it? Well, say this, say this, and then I'm gonna ask you a question about it. Uh, I I got to get my body in shape. Got to get my body in shape. What do you just do? Just said some words that you told me to. Okay, okay. So how would you say it? Put in your own words. Even people who's watching this right now, I'm saying to them, you guys watching in, say this out loud. I got to get my body in shape. Say that again. I got to get my body in shape. How would you put in your own words? Well, using what you said earlier, I am in the process of getting my body in shape, more okay. of kind of an action okay. statement. Okay, so when I say people, you guys at home, try this out loud. I got to get my body in shape. Now think about what you're saying when you say that. This is what I want people to think about. I got to get my body in shape, right? What am I doing? Most people say they're giving themselves a reprimand, they're commanding, they're mm. telling themselves to do something. No, you know what you're doing? You're making a separation of who you are. Who is I? <laughs> I got to get my body. That's two people. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling them that's the, that's the problem. So I always tell people, I got to get my body in shape. Then I always say, say this out loud. Body, get in shape. Body, they, get in shape. That'll never happen. Why? Because the I is gone. God made us in a three-part person. I'm a spirit, I'm a soul, I'm a body. That's the fight. So when people go into a gym or they get ready to do something in life, they're going to always have a three-part fight. Your body's going to want to do one thing. And remember, when I'm talking about the body, I'm talking about the five senses. They're going to want to do one thing. Your spirit's going to want to do another thing. And then your, then your uh, body, spirit, and soul, soul is one going to want to do one. And when they don't join together as one, then you're always going to be in a fight every day. And my goal is to, when I'm helping people, I want to bring people together as one. When I know I'm in shape is when my mind and body is together as one. Now I'm in shape. If I look in the mirror and think I'm in shape, by looking in the mirror, because mm, I'm going to be looking at other areas of my body. But yeah, but I need to lose this fat. But I need to do this, and I need to tighten this up. So when are you in shape? To me, it's when the mind and body come together as one. Then you are you where you want to be. So we'll wrap up. This, this is such an interesting conversation. Thank, thank Nothing you. that I thought we were going to talk about. But <laughs> <laughs> so what are you up to at the moment? What do you got going on, Billy? Well, right now I'm just, you know, just making a progress in Taibo because Taibo has been out for 40 years, you know. Oh, years. And, uh, and to me, that's what's, so, that's what's a blessing because usually when people come out with a fitness program, it go and it's gone. Yeah. But Tybo's been out for over 40 years, and it's, it's given me the opportunity to revamp it, change it, you know, because, you know, when I came out with Tybo, we didn't have social media. Now we have social media, and now I'm learning how to work with the social media to help build, help people become better. We didn't have internet when no, you started. No, didn't have any of that stuff, right? We had a big old phone, but now you have all these different things that you can reach out and you help save a life, you know? Yeah. And the goal is to teach people that there ain't nothing you can't do if you really want to do it. Fantastic. Billy, thank you so much thank for your you. time, sir. Thank you. That was, that was very interesting. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Chef Rush, thank you for joining me. Pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm a, I was a bodybuilder when I was younger, and I'm kind of like drawn to those arms. Like, how big are they? <laughs> uh, 24, actually. 24 and still growing. <laughs> wow. Like, is, is that all the cooking that does that? It's or? all the eating. <laughs> <laughs> they go hand in hand. <laughs> yeah. <many> pots. <laughs> so as well as cooking, like, what, what, what kind of training are you doing? Uh, you know what? I'll be very honest with you. I'm doing a cookbook right now. And it's very lifestyle driven, which I'm on the road. I put over 600,000 miles uh, on planes last year. 
Uh, sometimes I'm just in three different states in, in a week or and just keep going. So now my training had to variate, right? So my lifeline for foundation is just uh, endurance training, eating, working, uh, and trying to find out what copes my body and what works for my body and not just trying to jump to every routine or diet or whatever it may be. I let my body talk to myself. Of course, I get my blood work done. I see how my ticker is going and how things are to kind of deviate because as you get older, your body gets older. <laughs> how old are you? I'm young. <laughs> it, depends on, it depends on social media. How young are you? I'm, I'm young. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, well, the reason I ask is, is there's a lot of people who want to get a good physique yeah. and and so like when you was 16 like did did you kind of have natural arms like this when i was 16 uh actually as soon as i could walk my dad put me to work so he, he did construction hard construction so he taught me the principles and the foundation of very hard labor at a very young age uh, in which I still embed that to my lifestyle today. There's no one that can outwork me. And I say that regardless of how successful I am, how I started out, I've always been the same way working. It's right. a work habit, it's, it's ethics. <laughs> So were you, were you ever a skinny kid or? Oh yeah, of course. I was, really? of course. I was, you know, you got your endo, ecto, mecto, you know, as a, you know, endo. And I was just like, you know, not because I wanted to be, but because I didn't have a lot of food. Right. <laughs> so, you know, that you have to eat, you have to keep eating and doing that and going to school and, and working five miles to go to your job when I was going or working with your dad or whatnot and not eating every day. It was, it was eight of us at the time when I was a kid. <laughs> Right, and I was the next to the youngest, and, and there was about a ten year gap. So you had what was left over. I had what was left over. <laughs> Literally, I had what was left over. Like, oh, he's small; he'll get out, right? And um, uh, but there was no excuses. There was ever no excuses. And then I just, I just worked and just did. And uh, when I started growing up, there wasn't a, a gym. There wasn't a gym in Mississippi. We didn't have a YMCA. We actually did have YMCA, but they actually charge you. So I couldn't get to it. So I just had to learn through ethics and, and using the ground, the floor, and just natural things to figure it out. But when my, my, my dad started having me go and do construction with him, I didn't know those principles that that would help me a lot more than actually lifting weights. Those lifting, lifting those things that he had me lifting was a thousand times better. What were you so, lifting then? Everything, country slabs. It was kind of like a, um, a prince between um, strongman, uh, bodybuilding, calisthenics, and all those different things because you're using your body, your form, everything. Everything was so very organic. functional. Very functional, very right. functional. And did that for a very long time. And when I started playing sports, football, and all those different things, um, we had a little weight room that was really, really small. And so I just tried by trial and error. We didn't have a lot of people of fitness or influencers in Mississippi. Uh, and then one day my brother came home from the Navy and he left a book home that I saw. Actually, he didn't leave it. I actually kind of took it without him knowing. Uh, called in um, uh, the Body Builders Encyclopedia. Okay, yeah, yeah. And I looked at that book and I opened it up and I just studied the pictures when I was younger and like, oh, wow. This is nice. And not knowing that fast forward to the day that that same person would give me a call and we'll talk and we'll start being friends and he would take me all around and, and do events and inspire me to inspire other people. Wow. So what, when, you, what you, when you first started training then, what was your, like with real weights, as opposed to kind of, you know, working in the, in the building yard and stuff, what, what were your, what were some of the workouts that you did to build that, that base? And, and how, how much, because you know, a lot of people sort of ask these questions. It's like, what, what does it take to, to, to build a decent physique? Oh, wow. Uh, first off, what it takes is a mindset. <laughs> if, you don't have, if you don't have that personality or that, that drive or can't stop or, or and also I, I, a lot of what it takes is, is that don't look at everybody else. Just look at yourself. Don't say I want to be like this person or be like, just be your best of who you can be, in which my dad always taught me that, along with my mother. And then it was just putting the work. My workout was very simple. I had to learn things I actually still do to this day with my triceps when I finally got a, a little functional machine that you just did triceps with or biceps with, and we just had to figure it out. Figuring it out was meaning that I was doing a lot of reps or doing slow mos or doing pause sets or, or doing everything I could possibly do with just you know, making a, a functional machine that does like three exercises to turn them into 30. So uh, it wasn't, it wasn't the most, it wasn't the most logical, but it also wasn't always correct, but it was what I had at the time because I didn't know. 
Right. And what, has, has your training evolved to what you do now, or are you still following a lot of those same principles? No, no, training has evolved a lot. <laughs> in, in what way would you say? Uh, um, I mean, here at the Fit Expo, or you go to all the other shows, <clears throat> you see people do things and you learn from everyone. I'm a sponge. So anything that someone does, I'm going to learn from it, the same way I teach it or give it back out. But I also stay to my same principle of what, what I knew worked best for me. I may try something that somebody else has done or taught me or showed me uh, from anywhere, from the top to the bottom. But at the same time, if my body's not responding or if it's hurting me or whatever, I deviate and go right back to what I know, functional training. But at the same time, being a chef, I also know that, nine, that 80% of what I'm going to eat is going to help me a lot more so when I do that 20% of exertion into the gym and how I'm going to do it. Mm. You got to have that 80% of food, that 20% of, of, of drive, and then that 100% of mindset to put that together. So I kind of do anything from going you know, reps to aesthetics to you know, heavy weights with low reps to medium weights to high reps to low weights to high reps. I mean, that's why I can do so many push-ups. I just did the challenge today at 3 o'clock, and people say... How many did you do? Um, I do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I led the push-up challenge, and one of the questions I just asked coming up here... Was it the um, Eric the Trainer? Yeah, it was Eric okay. the Trainer. So I did that. I led that, and, you know, I was great friends with Eric, yeah. and uh, we did a lot of push-ups together. And I, I pushed for him today as I pushed for everybody else that was out in the crowd, and one of the young ladies came and asked me, how did you do that? How can you do those many push-ups? She said, what's your trick? What's your secret? I said, there's no trick. You're the trick. I mean, I'm almost 270, 270 pounds, and people say that you can't. First thing you do is get rid of you can't and just say you can. Mm -hmm. like, you got to try. So, um, I mean, it's a lot behind it. Yeah. And so you're so rather than you being, like, just into heavy weights, you're, you you do some heavy, you do some light, you do some high reps. Uh, yeah, I do muscle confusion. I'm, I'm the muscle confusion guy. I'm right. muscle confusion, I'm muscle memory, I'm endurance. So I still got to be able to carry myself on for the long haul. Like mm. I said, I'm still a young guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the same time, in 10 years, I still want to be able to do the same thing. I don't want to be the one of those guys that say, I used to. I used to look like you. I used to be this. <laughs> I used to be that. I hate that word. I used to. I used to. I'm not that guy. I never will be that guy. You don't look like a cardio guy, but you was in the military for quite some time. And my guess that part of being in the military oh, I, required... I, I love, no, I love cardio. So how, so how do you kind of balance that lot of weight with being able to do the cardio? So, you know, the funny thing is that cardio is one of my main things. Uh, I was scheduled for the Olympics for running. I was a track and field star. And uh, in the military, I ran the fastest time. You know, I used to do my my 13 minute two miles, uh, and every time I gained weight, I had to put I had to put weighted vest on to kind of deviate for that. So if I gained weight, if I gained five pounds, I had to put four, five more pounds on me and then run with that. You know, put a strap on and then run up a hill. So I had to deviate for that. I couldn't just like say I'm going to run faster because I had to compensate for that. So when I took that five pounds off, it made it equal. Right, if that makes sense. That was mm -hmm. my mindset. Said, okay, I gained five pounds, and let me put five more pounds on to keep it going. Now, when I'm doing workouts in the gym, I actually can burn more calories working out than I can doing cardio. Now it's the same. My cardio said I'm, I burn a thousand calories. My workout said I burn twelve hundred calories. So you look at it on that part of it, but at the same time, how am I doing it? Am I doing it for? Uh, vascularity, am I doing it for, you know, my heart rate, am I doing it for raising it up? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's different, but I do do functional training as far as uh, elliptical, uh, low impact, uh, a lot of sprints, a lot of rows and things of the sort. Right. We had Billy Blanks in here earlier. Yeah, Billy. Um, he, was, he was talking about his why, and he's obviously got this fire inside him yeah. that just kind of yeah. takes him beyond what his physical body can, be, can yes. take him. It sounds like you've got, you've got this similar thing in you that takes you beyond what your body can probably normally do. There's something that kind of pushes you. What is that in you? What, what, what is it that's doing it for you? What's that reason that you want to do this crazy stuff? You know, that's a that's a crazy great question <laughs> because so when you said Billy, and you said that I related because we had a conversation about that. You know, as he gets older, he gets better. <laughs> you know, no, seriously, as he gets older, he gets better. And you say, how Billy does that? The same energy, the same amount, all the time, all day. And I put it when a girl asks me or they do these videos about me. Said, how Chef Rush can do that? How can he do it? He can't do that. And the first thing I say is get rid of can. Turn it to can, and then you actually have to show them. You don't have to show them, but they just see it. They see it. 
The fire in me is for everybody else, for those people, those kids, or those ones, because mental health is so severe in this world today. It's a epidemic. It's a pandemic. It's, mm. it's everything. Now, 2023, I've been pushing for a lot of people. You know, that's one of my platforms. And I've had hundreds of thousands of kids and people with PTSD and women and men and children come to me and say thank you and for it. So I keep pushing. I keep letting them know that it's okay. I keep letting them know that we can do it together. The same way we did for Erica Trainer today, the same way I do for them. But uh, honestly, when they come and say thank you, I'm saying thank you back. I mean it. I need that as well. You know, it is a give and a give back. It's mm -hmm. not a take and a take. It's not a take. It's too much take in the world. If you have givers and givers, you'll never go wrong. You'll never go broke. you never go hungry. you never look over your back. A lot of people in this world, they want to see what you can give them and how much they can take from you. Mm -hmm. And the part about it is if we just give together and be at the same level and be at the same time, we won't have to worry about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And to me, people is what drive me. I'm not even supposed to be at the Fit Expo. I canceled everything I was going to do just to come here, just to get this energy so I can keep on giving giving and it was important i i've been here for the last two days and i've taken thousands of pictures and everyone's i'm sorry i mean i'm like no come I, I want you to take a picture i want you to know because you, there's a reason you came to me it's like you inspire me and you inspire me also for coming here because I, I hear so many different stories they don't just come from you for like oh my god you're a great bodybuilder or your, your arms or whatever they say i love your message i love what you do i love how you add comedy and you add the the, the stigma of different personalities or a PTSD or suicide awareness or, you know, toxicity or even trolls or bullying. So there's a lot of people we know that on the surface look as though they've got it together, you know, physically, mentally, but in, in a lot of cases, you know, they've, they've got, you know, demons going on in their head. Um, for, for people that are listening to this that are kind of in, in that place, what have you found as have, have, have some steps that you can take to kind of, I suppose, get a bit of a grasp on reality and, 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 and move slightly forward to where you are at the moment. Because it's one of the things that, you know, we've, we've talked about it quite a lot on, on, you know, with some of the people we've had today. You know, the, the, sometimes you can get into that mental state and, it, and it's, it's, it's a very dark place and it's very difficult to move on. What are your, what are your, been your experience in that? Um, I've been in those dark places. I, I, I live in those dark places. I was in an inpatient for six months, another inpatient for another three months, and then outpatient for a year. And I've, I've lived those. I've lived those. And, and honestly, I'll be extremely blunt with you, I'm still in those dark places. And I have to work on it each and every day. With PTSD, it doesn't just go away. It doesn't just stop. People say, I used to. There's no used to. You still live with it. It still can be triggers. Like I use coping tools. I use people as my coping tools. I use people and helping people to narrate, going to therapy over and over for a year and trying to find a balance. And there wasn't a balance. Or it was me actually fighting, you know, uh, unconsciously fighting with her or with him or trying to find out and then being medicated to death. I mean, medicated with a lot of medicine because they just said, let's just give them all this medicine. And that's what they did. And it was a lot. And I was lost and I felt like a puppet. And one day I came for a, a, a microsecond of, of clarity and I just threw everything away, which is the worst worst thing you could possibly do because I couldn't whim off all of those because it was like 30 different medications. And I would not have the time and the energy. <clears throat> and what happened was uh, withdrawals came. Withdrawals came, uh, but after a very long time and being sick from that, it was a clarity. And it felt like someone was lifted off of me. And then I had to change and look at myself in the mirror and say, okay, I need help. And that's when I started, I first did one of my national shows and I said, uh, you know, I have PTSD and uh, it's okay to say that. It's okay to say you have PTSD or have PTSD, but not okay not to get some type of support. You know, so I started getting support and I went over and over again. I had to find that balance with myself, even from meditation, which didn't work. And I did my own type of meditation that worked for me. You know, everything is not going to work for everybody. So don't try to force it. If it doesn't work for you, change it. If the therapist doesn't work for you, change them. If the medication doesn't work for you, change them. Don't just take somebody for their word and just try to do it. I didn't do that. I never was that person. And when I had that clarity and I changed it, and then after literally the longest of time, I realized that when I started meditating, I meditated about um, everything that was bad. 
Everything. Don't don't think about bad. I said, no, I have to. I have to because I have so many demons and they're going to be there every day waiting for me. They're going to wait for when I get up at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> and they're going to just be sitting waiting for me to mess up. So I had to think about them. I had to meditate about them. I had to accept that because the truth of the matter is that people try to say, well, I just keep everything positive around me. It is until somebody blows that horn or cuts you off. And then all of a sudden I got you mm -hmm. right in and there instead of just saying maybe they're in a hurry. Hmm, it'll be all right. I don't care. But, it's, but my mind, we triggers. We get triggered really easy. And so the thing about that is that I think about everything negative, and then I'm okay. I'm expected it. And every time something positive happened, it's enforced 100 times over for me. I want to see people, inspiring people. So if I have one bad apple in 100, it doesn't spoil the whole group. It right. just spoils that bad apple. I can deal with that. Right. I'm okay with that. I'm okay to throw that bad apple away and, t and save the other 99. Right. And do you, in, in terms of what you're doing now, you're helping a lot of people, you're, you, you're a big contributor. Is, is that part of, does, does that help in? Absolutely. <laughs> does it help? One million percent. It helps. It helps. What's your legacy? What are you living for? It's like your kids. You're, you're nurturing, adapting. I treat people in the natures of people like my kids. Like I would want people to treat my kids. If you think about that and stop being so selfish, you know, complacent or entitled and think about everybody else except yourself, we can all be on an equal level, whatever. Not thinking about the monetary value, not thinking about, you know, the celebrity value, the influential value, but just thinking about value in the same. Everybody has their own place. It doesn't matter on that part is, regardless of how it is or what it is, you just treat people the same. So when I say that about that is that I want everybody to look at everybody in that same light with that same respect. And that's the thing where it comes in where some people, and it happened to me a lot in the military. People looked at me, I was a big guy. I was here at what I am and they wanted to humble me per se, meaning that they want to flex and show that they were my superior. And that was a terrible thing to do to me because I was never that person. I did my job. I did my job diligently, diligently and there was no reason to. But some people just have these personalities or these ego, or whatever it is, just to show that they're empowered, make themselves feel better. And we get that every day in life. Mm. So how did you get into being a chef then? What was, what was that trigger? Because it sounded like, was it because you didn't get too much food when you was at home and, and, and that was just something you was drawn to uh, yeah, or what? Well, I, that was the case, I would never made it. So long story, uh, I, from Mississippi, my mom used to cook when I was younger. My dad never knew. Uh, he said the boys go to work, the girls go to school, and boys do not cook. Mm. So I used to sneak and cook with my mom and she used to let me and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the camaraderie of everybody sitting around a table and just just eating together and it was a whole different world of how it made me feel and so that's what made me fall in love with being a chef or just cooking actually uh, when I came to the military and, and realized in the culinary world which is a whole different world I just fell in love with that because I'm like this is different dimensions different things I became a master ice carver I became a pastry guy I became a bread guy I became a chocolatier a pastry you know sugar guy I just you're making me feel hungry <laughs> So I just fell in and felt the passion for it. Then I use the cooking part of my dietary training to use it with my health and fitness training because I realized, hey, these two go hand in hand together. Mm. These two, and I, and I was fortunate because my body talked to me at a long, young age, and I learned how to use them to align my cooking with my workouts, with my health, and my daily balance. Even though I have Uberman sleep cycle, which I don't get to sleep a lot, uh, and which I'm working on right now, you know, taking medication or doing this and that, but at the same time is that I'm a functional person like that. The same way you have a functional drunk or a functional person that can do this or someone that can run, you know, 100 marathons in 100 days, you know? It, do it doesn't matter. As long as that person is okay and taking care of themselves, it is what it is. So you went on to become the chef at the White House, is that right? What was, what was that experience like? Um, came over there functionally. Uh, it was a whole different experience. Whole were you, were you there for a purpose to just to, to cook regular food or were you there for a, like a, a, almost like a performance nutrition? No, 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 no performance <laughs> nutrition. <laughs> That's a whole different world. <laughs> uh, you know, I tell people like cooking can save lives and end lives yes. and start wars and, <laughs> and end wars. You know that. <laughs> um, and the thing about it was uh, it was very different. But when I actually first went over, um, something stuck in my head, what I've always learned in life, 
um, from my dad, and uh, I never even got to admire it. I never even looked at it. I never even thought it. I went in there as a job. I didn't look left or right. I went over because my dad embedded in me that whatever you do, someone wants you to fail. Someone wants you to fail. So instead of, even to this very day, I come in, I do my job to the hardest, to the best, most diligent. And even today when my guys say, Chef, I don't know how you do this. You're like all over the place. You're like every day, every time I see you, you surprise me. This is my job. This is what I do. Nobody can do it better. Nobody can do it harder, faster, stronger. It's just me. When I went into the White House, I said, somebody wants me to fail. I need to do my best, whether they love me or hate me, whether they want me here or not want me here. I need to prove people wrong. But I also need to prove myself right about me. So if I did leave, I know I did my best with no alibis. And is that what you felt you did while she was there? Were you... Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always going to do my best. I'm always <laughs> going to be, I'm always going to do my best. And I'm going to do it with pride. I'm going to do it with poise. And I'm also, you know, now as people know me, I'm a showboat. I like to have fun with it. And um, I want people to leave with an experience. Mm. I don't want, and I'm not going to lie to you, I hate boring chefs. I hate posh chefs. I hate those guys. I like guys who just have fun and enjoy food. And that's what I thats what I do when I do my demos. I teach them how to love and enjoy food for what it is. Not like, you know, trying to say fancy stuff or do fancy things. It's not like that lifestyle. This is just a regular lifestyle. Just live it. So how did you get in connection with uh, Gordon Ramsay? Um... How did I get it? He, he got to come back with me. Really? <laughs> if you do great things and positive things, people are going to notice. Right. If you do things the right way, I am blessed because I've never had to pick up the phone for anything. Right. Anything, ever, ever. And I'm fortunate about that. With no manager, with no agent, which I do have people now, but in the beginning, I was just blessed to just do my work. People said that it would never work. They said, Chef, you can't do that. You're all over the place. You're doing this over here. You're doing this over here. You're doing this over here. doing this over here. And I said, as long as I have one person, I'm okay. If that one person help a million, I'm great. If that one million people help 10 million, I'm fantastic. And I can die happy. But at the same time, I didn't waver on monetary values. I just wavered on myself, and I bet on myself. And so when you bet on yourself, that's your greatest worth and value, and people start noticing what you do. They come to you and say, I like you. I like who you, what you stand for. I like who you are. I like the way you engage and interact with other people, and I like what, you, what you're doing for your life, but other people's life as well. Did you ever have a vision, like coming from the military, you now got this, this TV show you're doing with Gordon Ramsay, I believe, Kitchen Commando, that's, that's uh, due to come out soon. Was, was this ever on your dream board to say, OK, this is where I want to be, or were you just, like you said, focus on, I'm just going to be the best bloody person I can and see yeah. what life gives me? Never on my dream board. Never on my dream board. I, I, I will tell you, when I retired from the military, they paid, us, they paid me, and how many years I did, $3,000 a month. That's nothing. Nothing, $3,000 a month is nothing for my retirement, right? I thought about, they say, hey, go get another job, and then retire again another 20 years or 20 plus years or whatever, and this, 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 and it was just unacceptable to me. And they, people try to say, this is your value and your worth. No matter how many degrees I had or whatever, because I was enlisted, they said, this is your value. This is your worth. This is what you're worth. And I was just like, okay, this is unacceptable. This is, this is, and it was actually, it made me angry, but also it made me hungry. It made me hungry to do better and prove more, to be more diligent, be more persistent, to be more aggressive. So even with my speaking engagements, which I do all over the world, you know, I've seen many people speak. I never got a chance to speak in front of people. But when you get an opportunity and God puts you in front of someone and he says, you have to speak. You can't say, oh my God, I'm shy, I'm nervous or whatever. You got to speak. And you got to speak the way where people can understand you and hear you. And they look at you and you command that presence and you command their content attention. So when I got up and they say, hey, you say, hey, we want to do this show about you, and you're the person that's going to be the star. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm okay with that. So I'm going to be the best star, the best person I'm going to be, and no one would ever know. You know what? No one ever knew that that wasn't, I never did it before. <laughs> no one. <laughs> so if you look back on, on, you know, the last 10 years or so, and, for, and I'm talking to people that are starting their journey, you know, want to be successful, want to get to the, 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 the shape they want, you know, want to, you know, look at you and think, okay, well, that's, that's a great place to be. What would you say was one of the one or two of the key decisions that you made looking back that put you on the right path as opposed because we can all make decisions that put us on the wrong path. But what would you say one or two other really important decisions that you made that that kind of you know set you in the right place? Uh, bet on you. 
I, I bet on myself, right? I, I literally bet on myself and I knowledge is knowledge is key. I didn't make any decisions. When I say bet on myself, I listened to myself and I found out because when I started doing what I was, everybody had an answer. Everybody knew the right answer. I, you can get, you'll go to people and say, and, and you'll get a hundred different answers, literally, without them knowing, knowing of whatever you have to be very logistical, strategic in your life plans and lesson. I am a strategical, logistical person. I don't use emotions. I'm not emotionless when it comes to stuff. You can say whatever you want to say. I don't care. Even if you offer me $5 to do an event, I don't care about that. I care about logistics. Logistics. Here's why. Why do they say that? What is it? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But at the same time, I made a conscious decision to say, I'm going to take a risk on myself. I'm going to do this. And when I did this, and even when I moved here to L.A., I made a risk. I make a calculated decision to say, I don't have the money for that. I don't have the time for that. What, what if? What's this going to happen? And then I just say, you know what, Chef? Just do it. Just do it. And then guess what happened? The pandemic happened. <laughs> and when that happened, I said, oh, what is going to happen now? It's a pandemic. I got all this money because L.A. is expensive. Yeah. I got all this money. I got another part. I got another house that's there, and it's a lot of money. And so I said, okay, now it's time to work. Go on social, look at this, look at that, and you just work on yourself. And I put everything in plan, but everybody else that was outside that need to have an audience, I didn't need to have an audience. I'm a virtual guy. I'm an outside guy. Everybody came to me and said, hey, can you do this? Can you do that? And now I'm a logistic guy, and that's how it happened. So everything just work, 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 and work some more. So to wrap up about... We, we can't leave without talking about food. So you, you're a very busy guy, traveling on planes, different hotels and stuff, and you keep in great shape all year round. And, and for people that have busy lives, you know, working late, families, a bit like kind of my wife over there, what, what's, what's some real kind of nutrition 101? So that, you know, very simply, like what can you do, cook, eat, to sort of keep you on the right nutritional track? Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm doing my cookbook now. This is my memoir. My cookbook is a, a lifestyle cookbook. It talks about people that's actually on the run, on the go, being very realistic about your health, fitness, you know, supplementations, what you eat, how you eat and whatnot. With me, I had to figure it out. People say, um, people say, well, I'm not a chef or I'm not this. And I'll just say, stop making excuses. <laughs> stop making excuses. It's too many different things now with your, your animal packs to carry your backpacks with your food stuff in it and ice packs or whatever, whatever. But things I'll say is I don't, I don't count macros. I don't do that. I don't, I don't go for diet fast or whatever. I've been doing things that people would say now that's called diet. I'm like, well, I was doing that 20 years ago. I never knew that was what it's called. <laughs> oh, it's not called that. Somebody just made it up so they can sell a pr bunch of products. The things I did was I, I, I use my complex carbohydrates. I do the things from my, you know, sweet potatoes, of course, my things, but I also use a lot of earth tone foods, right? That make my stuff do that. The day I did these demos and the people People loved it to death. They're like, you didn't use any sodium. And it was absolutely amazing. You didn't use this, you didn't use that. It was very quick. It took you five minutes to make this chicken <laughs> with this green sauce. And we couldn't believe that. We never would have we never would have thought that. It was healthy, it was nutrition, and it was functional. Being functional means that know your body and what you need to have. You want to do your carbohydrates, if you're trying to build your protein, if you're trying to build endurance, if you're trying to build weight, if you're trying to lose weight, you have to know knowing about your sleep habits. Like I said, my stuff is a little bit different, but you know you need your, your water intake, H2O, you need your, your sleep, you need your rest. You also need to be functional. Right. You have to know it. And don't say you don't have a gym because you have a floor. Stop making excuses like the gym sucks and I don't have anything and I just want to go out and run. Get down and do some push-ups. Get a band and do some stuff because it's just not <laughs> it, it just it's just not realistic not to do anything. Right. So what's next for Chef? You've got this program coming up. Do we are we gonna see like, you know, Chef Rush restaurants in Vegas soon or what what's what's happening that you can disclose? Um <coughs> it's, a, it's a lot coming up actually. <laughs> I mean, I'm just blessed to live each day by day and uh, collaborate and do things with some of the most greatest and most successful. I'm, I'm actually um uh, getting ready for um 
next month to do uh, cancel. I'm a spokesperson for Cancer Awareness, so I'm doing that for African Americans. I just did November for Cancer Awareness Month and um, homeless veterans. I do a lot of philanthropy for things that have a cause with me. Mm -hmm. I don't just want to do things that has nothing void. You know, I just talked to a couple guys today. Maybe some big things coming up with that, which I'm really looking forward to because I want to do things that's going to inspire other people and help other people besides helping myself. Of course, mm -hmm. I'm going to help myself as well because I got a family and this and that. And I tell people. Don't ever devalue your worth because to be greater, you got to do greater. So everything you do, do it big. That's a great way to end. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you've got any value from it whatsoever, then please do us a favor, like, subscribe, tell somebody, and that will help us to be able to continue to do more of these and help you escape your own personal limits. Thanks for listening.